We begin this morning a sermon on the theme, Jesus the Man. It was Pilate who, when Jesus came forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, which had been given to him in mockery, who said, Behold the Man. And that's all that he saw of Coas. And what a contrast it is to have this at the conclusion of the Gospel of John when it opened with the statement of John the Baptist, his forerunner, who said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so I trust that as we look at Jesus the man, we'll see beyond that in this series. This morning our subject is the hands of Jesus. And if we have a text this morning, it would be the 20th chapter of John at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, that is, the Lord Jesus to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And so we have an invitation here. Jesus invited Thomas to look at his hands. He insisted and actually compelled him to take a look. And today that invitation, I think, is for us also. Hands are probably the most human part of our anatomy. We do more things with our hands than any other part of our body. Most of us make a living by the use of our hands. The doctor does the lawyer, the scientist, and even the preacher. We talk with our hands, if you please. Many of us probably are more eloquent with our hands than we are with our mouth. And then we get in trouble with our hands also, and a sign that you see in many places, hands off, because these hands get us in trouble. Hands are an index to our character. The use of the hands reveals certain character traits. Tell whether we're grasping or whether we're giving. With our hands we can bless or pronounce a benediction or even throw a bomb. We can pull a trigger on a gun or place a thank offering on an altar with our hands. With our hand we write an epistle or we can wield a pistol. We can do either one with our hands. And therefore, it will be profitable today for us to look at the hands of Jesus. And he said, Behold my hands. And so this morning, as we look at them, there are certain features that we want to call your attention to. And the first one is, when I look at the hands of Jesus, the first thing that impresses me is that they are the hands of a man. He was a man in every sense of that term. He began as a little baby. He was born a baby yonder in Bethlehem. It was George McDonough that put it like that. He said they were looking for a king to lift them high. He came a little baby thing that made a woman cry. He came that way. And it was Leslie Savage in his poem who said, A baby's hands in Bethlehem were small and softly curled, but held within their dimpled grasp the hope of half the world. And then there is that lovely little definition of a baby that someone has written, a bald red head, a puckered face, hands blindly wandering into space, a wee faint smile, a stalwart squall, and yards of clothes to hide it all. That's a baby. And that was his picture, if you please. He came, that little baby thing, into the world. And he grew into boyhood. Dr. Luke was the doctor, you remember, that looked him over as he grew. And he gives us the only record. He says in the second chapter of his gospel, verse 40, 
And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He played as a child yonder in Nazareth. He romped with the other children. He laughed. He steadied. His hands got soiled and he had to wash them. And it was Luke again who looked at him when he was 12 years old and he could report in Luke 2.52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So he grew. And that's all we do now. From a juvenile to a junior, then to manhood. Like every other kid in Nazareth, he grew up. And I'm sure that one day someone, as he went by, said, Mary's son is really becoming a fine-looking young man, isn't he? And then he was 30 years of age, and he began his ministry. He walked the rugged trails of Palestine. He grew weary. He sat down to rest because he was human. He slept. He went to sleep in a boat one time. They had to wake him up. That's certainly human. He grew hungry. He could grow thirsty. He was even faint at times. He was tempted. He could feel pain. He prayed. He loved. And he rejoiced as any other human being. He was perfectly human. And I do not want to be misunderstood with that. I do not mean he was a perfect human being. He was that. But I'm saying something else just now. He was perfectly human. He comes across the centuries and is as familiar as if he'd been raised on our street. He's not aloof. You don't find him that way. The lowly always felt at home in his presence, and they still do. He was not a sanctimonious snob. He was not a quoter of pious platitudes. The publicans felt at ease in his presence and sinners gathered around him. Martha scolds him. Peter rebukes him. Thomas actually questions him. And all of them ask foolish questions of him, yet all of them worshiped him. He's warm. He's not austere. He's not inaccessible. And the perfume of his presence has come down through the centuries. He was gentle, but not weak. He had courage, but he was not brutal. He stretched out his hands, and the little children came to him, so much so that the poet has written, I think when I read that sweet story of old, when Jesus was here among men, how he called little children as lambs to his foal, I should like to have been with him then. I wish that his hands had been placed on my head, that his arms had been thrown around me, and that I might have seen his kind look when he said, Let the little ones come unto me. I say to you this morning, he was perfectly human, and he knew what trouble and suffering was. There is a passage in Hebrews And I must confess that I have as much difficulty with Hebrews as I do with the epistle to the Romans. I sometimes wish I knew what the writers really were talking about. I want to turn this morning to the second chapter of Hebrews and read a passage here. And I'm reading this morning from the Amplified New Testament. I read from it because as far as I can tell, it's the closest to what I think that the writer's saying, and yet I couldn't do better, I know, and so I read the Amplified. Will you listen to this? Rather extended passage, beginning verse 9. You follow your translation. But we are able to see Jesus, who was ranked lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor because of his having suffered death in order that by the grace of God he might experience death for every individual person. 
But it was an act worthy and fitting of his divine nature that he for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence in bringing many sons into glory should make the leader of their salvation perfect, that is, mature, through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. For he says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the worshiping congregation. I will sing hymns of praise to you. And again he says, My trust and assured reliance shall be fixed in him. And yet again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Now, verse 14, will you notice here? Since therefore children share in flesh and blood, that is, in the physical nature of human beings, he in a similar manner partook of the same that by going through death he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and also that he might deliver and completely set free all those who through the fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. For as we all know, he did not take hold of angels to give them a helping and delivering hand but he did take hold of the descendants of Abraham to reach them a helping and delivering hand. So it is evident that it was essential that he be made like his brethren in every respect in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things related to God to make atonement and propitiation for the people's sins. For because he himself has suffered in being tempted, he is able to run to the cry of those who are being tempted and tested and tried. What a picture, my friend, that is, of the Lord Jesus. He knew what trouble was down here. And since he knew what trouble was and he endured it down here, we're told he's able to help those today who have trouble. And trouble is just the cement today that binds all of us together. We all have trouble. The song goes, Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I have news for you. The song is wrong. Somebody does know the trouble you've seen because he knew that trouble. And none of us have endured all trouble as he did. It's been put in this whimsical little verse like this. The good Lord sends me troubles, and I have to work them out. But I look around and see this trouble all about. And when I see my troubles, I just look up and grin and count up all the troubles that I'm not in. May I say to you this morning, none of you have all the troubles. He had them all. He bore them all for you and me. He was human. Those hands were the hands of a man. And one day they arrested him, and they took those hands and nailed them to a cross until those hands were dead. And then they took him down and buried him. As I see the hands of Jesus, I see the hands of a man. There's something else. The second tremendous fact I see as I look at the hands of Jesus, they're the hands of a working man. He had what is called today the horny hands of toil. And that enlarges and enhances my conception of him today. I don't think we can fill in those silent years exactly, but we do know some things about those silent years. From 12 to 30, there's no reference concerning him. But we know, according to the tradition of that day, that a Hebrew boy, up to the time he was 14, he studied, and then he was initiated into worship. He had his bar mish mitzvah, is that it? And he had his. And then 
He was taught a trade. Every Hebrew boy was taught a trade. It was said by the rabbis, He that teacheth his son not a trade teacheth him to be a thief. And just as Paul was a tent maker, the Lord Jesus was a carpenter because Joseph was a carpenter and Joseph taught Mary's son to be a carpenter. And if tradition is accurate, and it may be, Joseph died when Jesus was still in his teens and he became the head of the house. He was the carpenter of Nazareth and when he started out, that's what they saw and that's what they said and they were accurate. Behold the carpenter. That's what he was. My friend, he had the hands of a working man. And that day that he entered the temple, having made a whip out of cords and drove the money changers out, why do you think they went out? Because they thought he was God? They did not. They saw a man that was big enough and strong enough to put them out, and they got out. The hands of a working man, if you please. And it's interesting to me to note a laboring man will someday settle all the disputes of this world. That's a very interesting commentary, but it will be this laboring man, if you please, who will settle the disputes of this world. So when I look at his hands, I see the hands of a working man. And then I look again and I see the hands of a sinless man. And that makes his hands different from all others. It was the psalmist in Psalm 24 who said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor swollen deceitfully. Let's me out. I don't think I could be in the holy hill on that kind of a requirement. And I'm not sure, but I don't think you could be on the holy hill on that kind of a requirement. But he can. Sinless hands. Have you ever noticed what the Word of God has to say concerning him? He says, Which of you convinceth me of sin? And after 1900 years, it's still a good question. They have not been able to convict him of sin yet. He was sinless. And you find that the Word of God is very careful to emphasize that. John in his epistle, first epistle 3, 5 says, In him is no sin. Peter in 1 Peter 2, 22, who did no sin. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, who knew no sin. He knew no sin. He did no sin. And there's no sin in him. And the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15 that he's without sin, holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And the man that probably was closer to him as an enemy was Judas. And Judas spied on him for three years. And if there was anything wrong in his life, Judas would have discovered it. And Judas admitted, even after he betrayed him, I have betrayed innocent blood. And he could say this, the prince of this world cometh and he finds nothing in me. What about you? Every time he comes around me, there's always a handle there somewhere to take hold of. But when... He came to the Lord Jesus. He found nothing in him. I see the hands of a sinless man. That's not all. I see something else. I see the hands of a friend who can help. Have you ever noticed that Christ performed most of his ministry with his hands? There was power in the touch of his hands. And I won't add this. There's been no power in any man's hands since then. 
With his hands he touched the sightless and staring eyes of a blind man. A leper came, and we are told that Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and he reached out his hand, and he took her by the hand. He took five loaves and two little fishes, and he put them in his hands, and he multiplied them and passed them out to the multitude. He went into the home where the little daughter of Jairus lay dead. And he put forth his hand and took her by the hand. And he said to her, little lamb, wake up. And she waked up. There was a funeral coming out of the city. It was a widow's son. He broke up every funeral he ever attended. And he touched the casket with his hand. It was over the tombstone of Oliver Goldsmith in St. Paul's Cathedral that you find this inscription. He touched nothing that he did not adorn. I do not know whether that is always accurate concerning Oliver Goldsmith, but I do know this, that everything that Jesus touched was adorned with new beauty and new life, and there's still power in the touch of his hands. May I say I see something else. I see the hands of a Savior. Will you notice what Zechariah had to say? It's a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Will be at his second coming. Zechariah 13, 6 says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Zechariah says the day is coming that when he comes again, that even those who crucified him will say, What in the world is the meaning of those wounds in your hands? And he says, I receive those in the house of my friends. Zechariah also adds, that then they'll weep and wail because they'll recognize then that he was the one that they'd crucified. Thomas is a forerunner of unbelieving Israel. Thomas had to see. And when he saw, he fell down and said, My Lord and my God. That'll be the position yet in the future of the nation Israel. But my friend... When he was crucified yonder on the cross, those hands were outstretched there. The enemies gathered around and they said, Come down from the cross. And they said it in mockery. They didn't believe he would come down and he didn't come down. Because if he had come down, you and I will never be able to go up. But since he did not come down, our hope is someday we will go up. But in that crowd there that day, there's a man that I'm almost sure was present. I could not prove it. I will not insist upon it, but I think he was there. There was a brilliant young Pharisee studying in Jerusalem by the name of Saul of Tarsus. I think he was really the hope of the people. I think Gamaliel had pointed him out and said, This young man has a tremendous future. He was brilliant. He hated Jesus. He says that he did. No enemy of Jesus has been quite as bad and ferocious as this man. He hated him. I do not believe that the day they crucified Jesus that this young man stayed home. I don't think he would have missed it for anything. And in that crowd of Pharisees gathered there that day when they shot out the lip at him, I think Saul of Tarsus shot out the lip. When they mocked him, he mocked him. He hated him. Then one day he met him. And when he met him and came to know him as his own personal Savior, this man could go back to that cross. And he could look at those hands that were outstretched and see something he never saw before. Those hands are outstretched for me. And then Paul could write, He loved me, and he gave himself for me. 
He was there that day and saw his hand. There was someone else that came when he died. Two men had been in hiding. They were rich men. They were prominent men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. These men, as long as he was alive, stayed undercover. The minute that he was arrested and died, they came out in the open, and the disciples, the apostles, went undercover. And they take down the body. I'm almost sure that as they took down the body, they talked. I'm sure that when they put it in Joseph's new tomb and they began to put the ointment, that hundred pounds worth, and also wind the linen cloth around him, I'm sure that Nicodemus said, Joseph, it was about three years ago here in Jerusalem one night, the first time that I ever met him, he told me that night something I at that time knew nothing about, a new birth. And he said in order to experience that new birth that he'd have to be lifted up. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then he gave me this statement, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And I'll be honest with you, Joseph, at that time it was very meaningless to me. But you see those hands? Before we bind them up, take a look at them. You see those ragged nails, scars there, the open wounds? Joseph, those hands were wounded for my sin and revealed that God loved me and gave his son to die for me. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down, did e'er such love and sorrow meet. Our thorns compose so rich a crown. The hands of Jesus. Let's follow Leslie Savage's poem on. A baby's hands in Bethlehem were small and softly curled, but health within their dimpled grasp the hope of half the world. Our carpenters in Nazareth were skilled with tool and wood. They laid the beams of simple homes and found their labor good. A healer's hands in Galilee were stretched to all who came for him to cleanse their hidden wounds or cure the blind and lame. Long ago the hands of Christ were nailed upon a tree, but still their holy touch redeems the hearts of you and me. There is still power in the hand. Will you take one more look at those hands? With those hands he holds his own today. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any created thing pluck them out of my hand. He holds his own today with nail-scarred hands. A little boy one night was said, I'm thirsty. His mama said, go into the kitchen and get a drink. He says, it's dark, I'm afraid. The daddy of the little boy got up and took him by the hand and led him into the darkness. And the little fellow looked up as he brushed his tears away and said, Daddy, I'm not afraid now. May I say that he holds his own today in the world. And then in closing, he today holds out his hands to this world. Have you ever noticed 
that for 1900 years he has been blessing this world. He sended into heaven in the attitude of blessing. The last view that the world had of him, his hands were outstretched, not on the cross, but outstretched in blessing. That's very suggestive. Paul, in writing to the Romans, in Romans 10:21, he says, "But to Israel he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people, and today his hands are outstretched to this world. This idea today that God is somehow or another with a big club wanting to hit somebody. His hands are outstretched to a world today. And he wants to say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You knock with the hand. If any man will open the door, I'll come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And that's the human heart with his hands today. He knocks at your heart's door. H.B. Stowe put it like this, knocking, knocking, who is there? Waiting, waiting, oh, how fair. Tis a pilgrim, strange and kingly, never such was seen before. Ah, my soul, for such a wonder, wilt thou not undo the doer? Knocking, knocking, still he's there. Waiting, waiting, wondrous fair, but the door's hard to open. For the weeds and ivy vine with their dark and clinging tendrils ever round the hinges twine. Knocking, knocking, what still there? Waiting, waiting, grand and fair. Yes, the pierced hand still knocketh, and beneath the crowned hair beam the patient eyes so tender of thy Savior waiting there. He's knocking at your heart's door, friend. Look at his hand. Look at his hand. The psalmist said in Psalm 31, 15, My times are in thy hands. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. That was the cry of the psalmist. And friends, today, don't look at your hands. (laughs) I don't know. Those lines mean nothing. My times are in thy hands. And your eternal destiny today is in the hands of Jesus Christ. My times are in thy hands. Jesus the crucified. Those hands my cruel sins have pierced are now my guard and guide, the hands of Jesus. Won't you look at them? It's the hands of a Savior and a Sovereign today. Shall we pray? As we come to the Lord now in prayer in this brief moment, before we pray, I'm wondering if you are present today, and maybe the Spirit of God has made audible to your inner ear the knocking of this Savior. He not only died for you 1,900 years ago, but patiently. Patiently he comes to your heart's door, and he'll come no farther. He'll come no farther. He'll never crash the door. He'll never break it in. In fact, he will not even open it. You have to open it. That's your part. My part is over. I've tried to let you see the hands of Jesus. But you'll have to open the door. I'm wondering as we come to the Lord in prayer, if you are here today, and the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart, you need someone today, someone with hands, 
that can reach down into your life, straighten out all the tangled cords that are there, and bring to you a peace and a joy that he alone can give. And he can give it. He does give it. He will give it. If you this morning will open your heart door.